I say action. All right, so um, Jim Morrow is going to speak today in the SAGE seminar about um, complex, well, drawing graphs of certain complex functions. Okay, so what I'm going to do is to show you how, if I had thought about it ahead of time, I could have used SAGE to explain some things to my <coughs> complex analysis class that puzzled them. And in fact, I think they're not really well explained anywhere. I, I looked around to see if I could find explanations of some or answers to some of these questions in textbooks or to see how some of this stuff was visualized in various uh, websites and what on. And it seems like people don't really address the questions or the right things that the students are asking. So the, um, in the process of you know, creating this talk, I talked to a lot of people. I mean, Tom helped me a lot. And, and uh, William has answered lots of questions. And Robert Miller, who unfortunately wasn't able to be here today, but, but he's helped straighten me out on a number of things. And you will probably recognize in portions of the talk where you've made a contribution. But anyhow, um, and, and also, I'm happy that you asked me because it'll give me a chance, as you'll see when I go along here, to get some of my other questions answered, which haven't been answered yet. So this is a terrific thing to have an audience full of people who can answer all of my questions. And that way I don't have to go through you to you one at a time. Um, there is a program which I think you might want to look into putting on SAGE. And that there's this program on conformal mapping that Don Marshall wrote. It's called Zipper. Mm -hmm. And it's in Fortran. It's on his website. It, you can copy it and, and uh, you know, put it on a Unix system and, and compile it and run it. it. It's not right now something that you can just interact with directly on his website. So it would take some development work to convert mm -hmm. it to whatever would be appropriate to put it into Sage. But I think it would be a good piece of software to have in Sage. Um, and it's, you'd have to go to Don and ask him whether he'd give you permission to do it, but uh, it's not something that's copyrighted as far as I know. I mean, it's just something that Don developed over time. In fact, um, I was involved in the early development of, of the idea of producing this conformal mapping. Don had a mechanism for, um, so suppose you have a polygon with a large number of sides, or rather, let's suppose you take a, let me just draw on the blackboard here to, to visualize. So, Let's suppose I have a, a fairly complicated, simply connected region, and I want to map it to the unit disk. I want to find a conformal map to the unit disk. Or, one, or I want to take the unit disk and map it to this. One thing you might think of doing is putting in lots of intermediate points and creating an enormous polygon, and then use some numerical algorithm to make the map the, the polygon that you get this way to the unit disk. Now, there is theoretically a way to do this. That's the schwartz christoffel transformation, which is in the case that you put maybe 100 subdivision points is at the time that we were looking at it, it's actually impossible to, I mean, to evaluate all the integrals that you get uh, numerically accurately in order to produce this mapping. Since then, some other people have thought about the schwartz christoffel ma mapping and, and uh, discussed how you could actually make the calculations accurately enough, and I've given a reference up here to some recent work on there. So there's a paper published in 2006, and then also some work by Nick Trefethen, and those are references for how to use the schwartz christoffel mapping to, to do this. And so you could imagine your, your, your big region as being composed of a polygon that's so finely subdivided, you might as well think of it as a big polygon. And then you can produce the conformal mapping, and then you can use that to um, answer any questions that might involve conformal mapping questions, like trying to find flow around, you know, the flow of a fluid around some obstacle, or, or what, what the flow looks like of air over some complicated airfoil or something like that. So you, you can actually now do those things pretty accurately. But at the time that Don and I were looking at this, there wasn't an alternative. I mean, there wasn't a, um, the schwartz christoffel transformation was not a good way to do this mapping. And so uh, we looked at, at another way of doing it, and we, had, we produced an algorithm for computing this conformal mapping, but we could not prove that it converged. I mean, it clearly converged. We could run it, and everything worked real nice, but we couldn't prove it converged. So I, I stopped thinking about it. And maybe 10 years later, Don and Stefan Rota came up with a proof of convergence of the algorithm. But anyhow, so it's there. And I, you, know, you might want to set somebody loose on it trying to incorporate this into SAGE. Um, and I have not looked very carefully at what's 
what the algorithms are that are described by this three author paper, which has gotten a lot of publicity recently. And, uh, and Nick Trevethan's work, which I know has a good reputation. I don't know what the algorithms are, but they might also be things that would be good to think of incorporating into SAGE. Do you, do you know what is in SAGE in the way of conformal mapping programs, if there are any? Absolutely nothing. Nothing? Okay, well, there's a start. <coughs> Um, if there have been requests. To, what's that? There have been requests. Yeah. There's nothing there. Um, okay, so we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, it's, not, it's not so much, yeah, okay, so what's a conformal map? A conformal map is, can be described in lots of different ways. One, one way in complex analysis to describe it is that the map should be locally um, orientation preserving. So if you have two curves that intersect at a certain angle, it'll map to two curves that intersect at the same angle with orientation preserved. And also, it should preserve um, scale in every direction. In other words, it should map small circles to small circles, infinitesimal circles to infinitesimal circles, not to infinitesimal ellipses. I know it sounds like there shouldn't be any distinction, but there really is. In fact, you can define um, a conformal map to be one which is differentiable and takes infinitesimal circles to infinitesimal <coughs> circles. And um, if you look real carefully, that's good enough to guarantee that the, the map satisfies the cauchy riemann equations and hence is, is a complex analytic map and, and so on. So that's a, an appropriate definition of what a complex analytic function is. At least it's okay at places where the derivative is different from zero. If the derivative is equal to zero, then it's kind of difficult to say what it is you mean. So what you might do is not talk about those points. Think that you have a certain finite number of points where you don't make any statement about what happens to angles. And so you have a finite number of singularities and you can handle those by things like the Riemann removable singularity theorem and so on. So they can be dealt with in a certain way abstractly. But if you want to think geometrically, then uh, here's the thing that, that puzzles a lot of people. And if you think closely about it, it really is a puzzle. Suppose you have, um, take the definition of complex analytic and the ordinary definition. So you, you assume that a function has um, a complex difference quotient and the limit exists at every point. At some points that limit of, that difference quotient, the limit will be different from zero. And, and then if you think of the complex number that you get, you can think of it geometrically as acting by <coughs> multiplying by the modulus of that complex number and rotating by the argument of that complex number. And that is the way the derivative acts infinitesimally on tangent spaces. But um, what do you do when the derivative is equal to zero? When the derivative is equal to zero, as a map of tangent spaces, it just takes everything to zero. It doesn't give you any information. So you'll see a lot in textbooks that the claim is that when the derivative is equal to zero, let me figure out how to negotiate this thing here. Okay, so um, when, when the derivative is equal to zero, uh, you can't characterize conformality that way. And so what you'll see stated is, let's look at the order of the zero of the derivative. If the derivative has a zero of order m, then locally it should act by multiplying angles, by changing angles between curves and multiplying them by m plus one and you'll see kind of hokey arguments to, to that effect. But of course the derivative takes everything to zero. So what does it mean to say that it takes curves that make a certain angle and maps them to curves that make angle in, with each other um, m plus one times that angle? So funny little arguments are given for that and they're, they're usually hand wavy approximate arguments and you look at what happens to some curves and you try to look at the way secants uh, behave on the curves and how the, the angles between the secants change as you take a limit and you sort of convince yourself that that's correct. Um, the first thing to do would be to take a, a simple example because the easiest examples, and, and they're prototypical, is to consider maps of the form z to z to the n. Okay, so that function has a derivative at the origin and uh, the derivative is of order m minus one, so it should multiply angles by, by m. So what does that mean? It should mean, um, 
So it should mean that if no, oh, this is showing just, up too well. Um, there are supposed to be a red line and a green line, making a small angle with each other. And now you look at what happens to those two lines under the map uh, z to z to the six is what I plotted here. So the images are not two lines. That's the first thing. So it shows you that that uh, these this map doesn't preserve smoothness of curves. I mean, what could be smoother than a straight line? But the image of so let me draw it like this. So the image of such a straight line under the map that takes z to z to the six. So let's take that to be the origin. Is actually that it's a ray. What happens is that it doubles over on itself, and this is not a smooth curve at that point. It does not have a tangent at that point. So you can't talk about it mapping tangents. In fact, um, if, I, if I had used an odd number up here, like z to z cubed, you would have been fooled into thinking that, so in, if I look at the map that takes z to z cubed, it actually maps to a straight line. But what it does is it rotates everything around a couple of times and so things overlap and you don't see what goes on. The easiest way to understand what happens here is if you take two lines that intersect in the origin and look at the map, say, that takes z to z squared or z to the fourth or z to the sixth, then what you get in the image is this. So this goes to a ray and that goes to a ray. And this angle right here, it's true, it gets multiplied by um, six in this case. So that's the sense in which angles get multiplied. You can't, it's not fair to talk about the tangents at this point but because there's, there, it doesn't preserve tangent vectors. All tangent vectors get mapped to zero. And the only way to really understand it is to understand that the fact that the map that takes z to z to the six or z to any power different from one turns a curve that's not singular into a curve that's got a singularity at that point. It, would, it might be a little bit clearer if I if I'd looked at curves instead of straight lines because then these things would have come in like that and you would have seen some uh, obvious pair of curves that has a cusp and, and got a singular point. And so that would explain a little bit about what it means when you, when you talk about um, the, these things about the, the difference between conformality, which is preserving angles and orientation, and what happens when you look at points where angle and orientation is not preserved. Um, so that's, that's still not the, here's the question that some of my students asked. The map that takes z to z squared or z to z to the sixth, it's conformal everywhere except at the origin. It preserves the angles of all intersecting curves and it sends them to non-singular curves except at the origin. How can that be? Suddenly when you get to the origin, angle is not preserved. It gets duplicated. You, angle gets multiplied by six, whereas at all close curves, angle is preserved. I mean, the function z to z to the six, it's a continuous function, highly differentiable. How can it happen that that angle changes so abruptly? Everything inside is differentiable. Doesn't make any sense. How can it suddenly go from, from preserving angle and orientation to instantaneously multiplying by some factor? <coughs> and unless you see you know, visualize what goes, what goes on, I don't think you'll even accept it. It doesn't make any sense. And it's kind of hard to explain it in a hand-wavy sense. You actually need to look at the curves. Okay, so here's what I've got plotted. And this is still not showing up very well. And I should have erased the axes. I didn't think about it at the time. Um, so there's uh, pairs of lines intersecting at right angles there. They're red, green, and blue. And I'm going to look at the map z to z squared on those lines and see what they map to. Okay, so they're going to map to curves that intersect at right angles. They have to because the map these are point these are curves that are not intersecting at the origin. And so the the curves that you get um, are going to look like that. Now those intersections points they're actually right angles. It's hard to see it, but they're actually right angles. The blue axes, the, bl the blue curves, are very, they're intersecting at a point that's very close to the origin. And so if you look at the center of that uh, diagram, let's see, I think I've got a plot. Nope, I don't. I forgot 
to put that into that in here. Um, so if you use two fingers, Jim? What's that? If you put two fingers on the pad and you move up, it'll scroll. Okay, you can probably scroll faster than I can control. You no, no, it's really nice. Two fingers on the pad. Two, two fingers yep. on this pad? Yeah, and then just drag. No, you you have to put the mouse yeah. over the, like, move the mouse a little to the left. The other way. That, just, yep. Over here? Oh, yeah. on that little thing there? No, anywhere, just over anywhere. to the left. Yeah, and now use two fingers to slide up and down, and then it'll... Ah. <laughs> In there? You could also probably use... Yeah. Yeah, okay. But anyhow, so what you want to do is to look right in here. So those curves that intersect, they're intersecting at right angles. Every one of those curves is intersecting at right angles. Um, and in fact, these, these two sets of curves, they only intersected at one point in the domain. But the image point, there are two places where they intersect. So the, curve, the, the curves mm -hmm. that are um, horizontal, So take this curve that's horizontal. The map that takes z to z squared maps this curve to a curve that looks like that. And this curve that's vertical, it gets mapped to a curve that looks like that. So there was one point of intersection, but then there, in the image there's two points of intersection. But in any case, this right here, I haven't drawn it very well, but that's a right angle over here. And when you slide this in towards the origin, then what happens to this curve, as you can see in the picture, um, look at, at this curve right here, you see how sharp that turn is. The, and the closer you get to the origin, the sharper the turn is, but the intersections are still right angles. And so eventually what happens is that you, you look at the intersection, and it's going to look like there's a right angle here, and then it's essentially flat like that. So as you move towards the origin, eventually this, this line, this right angle, becomes a flat angle, even though it doesn't do it continuously. At the moment that you hit the horizontal line, then it will be a, a flat angle. But before that, it will have always been a right angle. So it goes from being something that's a right angle to something that's twice a right angle um, abruptly. It doesn't change continuously. But, but if, if you don't... Um, if you don't look at the drawing, you can't see how it could possibly have happened. But it just happens that these, these curves suddenly flatten out real quickly when you're close to the origin. And it's um, it, it's the sort of thing that it doesn't sound like it's a reasonable behavior because you've got a continuous function that's, you think it's continuous, but its action isn't continuous. It's, it's, it's continuous for a while, but suddenly it jumps. It's got a discontinuity. Um, anyhow, so I could have done a better job, I think. I should have blown that point up so you could have seen it a little bit better. But it would have, it would have uh, clarified how it could happen that um, this function can be conformal everywhere except at a certain point where it can behave very badly. And in fact, a better way to think about this is, is to think about uh, what happens in the small. Because, so if I go back up to teach me how to not phrase the mouse. So in, in this case, this angle right here is pretty small. And here's another thing that bothers some students. Suppose I make it pretty big. If I make it big enough, it's going to turn out that doubling that angle will produce, let's say, let's suppose, well, multiplying it by 6. If I took the mm -hmm. angle to be 2 pi over 6 and multiply it by 6, then suddenly the angle is 0. You don't see any intersect. And so, which of the angles do you take among the possible things that you get by doubling to be the one that's, I mean, how do you decide? It's a, it's a question about arguments. How do you figure out what, what uh, the multiple is? And the only way to understand it is to look at small angles, not look at big angles. Because if you look at them too big, then it will be very difficult to see how often things wind around. And you'd have to, you have to do it continuously. So you should start at a small angle and show, slowly widen it to see how um, things change. And here's a situation where um, I think I could have done a better job of explaining this if I could have made a movie. And I'm going to make that point a little bit later. Is there a way to make a movie so that... The animate command? 
What's that? There's a command called animate. Okay, so t explain it to me. What does it do? Uh, if you have a sequence of sage plots, you say animate, and you give as input a list of plots, and then it will animate through them. Okay, so that's a sequence of plots. But yeah. can you do something so that it would select um, very closely, I mean, without me having to tell it how closely yep. to space the sequence, so it could essentially continuously vary between two limits? So I could say vary the angle between zero and and yep. and thirty degrees, and then animate, take these lines, and slowly move them apart you can use at some rate. To kind What's of, that? You can use interact to control it yourself, but it won't be smooth. Okay, that's a good idea. So I could have used the mouse. Yeah, that's a good idea. That would have you could drag a slider, which sets the angle. What's that? You could use interact to make a little slider, which right. would set the angle. Terrific. I sure could have. Would it be like a, a draw? So I, I could have slid along the yep. angle and it would mm -hmm. basically treat it like a real variable. Yes. And then it would take yep. that angle and... Yep. Okay. That would, have, that would have made it much clearer because at some point you end up coming back on yourself again and then, well, should, angle, should you have said that that's multiplying by zero or multiplying by two or multiplying by three or whatever. So that would have made it much clearer what it means. Could you move up a little so you can see the code you're running there? See what's... What you look, what you look? I, the code that you were running, I couldn't see it because it was partly covered. Okay, oh, good. the stuff that I wrote in the beginning was pretty clumsy. I just kept adding things. So the two angles you're using are point 0.1 and point 0.2? Yeah. So optimally, you'd want to change that code so you can replace the point 0.2 by various real mm -hmm. numbers and right. then see what happens. Exactly. Yeah, so I'd make that a variable or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see? <laughs> yeah. Suddenly, suddenly you don't see any duplication anymore. Yeah, so you can drag it a little, let go, and you'll see the new mm -hmm. position. Yeah, that's really good. And also, it clearly is showing you that there's an angle right there, uh, yeah. which wouldn't be so obvious unless you do the dragging, and you'll see that what's... So that's, this is a curious thing. This function, which is as nice a function as you can imagine, z to z squared, does not take smooth curves to smooth curves. So what do you mean by smooth curve? You mean a smooth, you mean a curve that has a well-defined tangent at each point. It takes the straight line to something that doesn't have a well-defined tangent. It's it's got an endpoint, but it doesn't have a well-defined tangent. So is there a name for complex analytic functions that send smooth curves to smooth curves? Conformal. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Everywhere conformal. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait hold on. What's if that? and only if? Or, I mean, I'm just requiring that it sends smooth curves to smooth well, curves. Well, so when I, when I say smooth, I want to have well-defined tangents that are required. Yep. So but I'm not making any requirement that tangents be, you, relative you, tangents okay. be preserved. Is that yeah, like a Yeah, you, you've got to think about what's, what's meant by, so it's a parameterized curve that you're yep. producing. Yep. And in some cases, there's no parameterization that you can think of that would make that point smooth, like a right. ray. There, I, I don't care what, what way you parameterize that. At the origin, you're not going to have right, a tangent right. at that point. Whereas in some other situations, here's here's the screwy thing that occurs. Um, th the image curve really consists of, and it's hard to see this, two rays that point in opposite directions. And so in a certain sense, that is still a singular point. It doesn't matter that the whole thing set together can be parameterized, right, right, right. but there, I'm still going to call that a singular. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, and, and but that's what but happens at any point where the derivative is zero. So, wait, but is sending smooth curves to smooth curves equivalent to conformal? Or no, no, it's, it's just not. that conformal it's implies not. it. Conformal implies it. Okay. Right. Is there a name at, for at the of conformality? Is there a name for the class of holomorphic functions that send smooth curves to smooth curves? Um, well, in the case of an analytic function yep. uh, being conformal is equivalent to having derivative not equal to zero, and, and that's um, 
And, ah, and okay. in the case where the derivative is equal to zero, we got a problem. So it's, mm -hmm. it's an if and only if for that. But what okay. you might be thinking of is there a way to do yeah, this yeah. without Being the assumption of complex yeah. differentiability. Yeah. Um, and you've got, you got to be careful because it turns out almost any, any geometric thing that you can think of in the, in, uh, in t together with real differentiability is going to imply complex conformality, uh, you know, mm -hmm. complex differentiability. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's actually a very strong condition. So if I just told you that a map had to be orientation preserving and, and, um, um, and angle preserving, if I just, and I told you that the map is differentiable, it's automatically a complex analytic map. That's all you need to know. And that's not a trivial result, but it automatically implies the cauchy riemann equations and that what you have is a complex analytic system. Um, it does, so you can have other maps that are, um, that take smooth curves to smooth curves. Any map that has, any map from two space to two space whose Jacobian is different from zero will take smooth curves to smooth curves, but it won't be angle preserving. So as soon as you throw in angle preserving, um, that's the conformality, suddenly you're in a new, much more rigid situation and the map's conformal. And it's what complex is, analytic. What does quasi-conformal mean? Quasi-conformal means that it takes little circles to ellipses, to little ellipses. Mm. So they're close to being conformal, but not quite. And they have some of the same features of, as conformal maps, but uh, there's no uh, no, no uh, theory like uh, Cauchy, about the Cauchy mm -hmm. interval theorem or anything like that. And there's certainly things that are well studied, but um, they're, in that case, what you do is you just simply classify them by that statement that they take infinitesimal circles to infinitesimal ellipses. That's the definition for mm -hmm. quasi-conformal. Um, and there's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to, uh, I don't know too many general theorems about them, but they're certainly um, popular topics for study. And I think Lars Alfors got the first Fields Medal for his study of quasi-conformal maps. Well, he and Jesse Douglas, who got it for his uh, study of the plateau problem. Those were the first two Fields Medals, Alfors and Jesse Douglas. Okay, so let's see. Where's the mouse? I've never heard of Jesse Douglas. You've never heard of Jesse Douglas? Yeah. There's a big nice write-up about him in one of the latest bulletins. Cool. A write-up about the controversy between, about who first solved the plateau problem. Was mm -hmm. it Jesse Douglas or was it Tibor Radeau? Yeah. They both published at roughly the same time. And it, and, but Jesse Douglas got the Fields Medal and Radeau did not. Wow. And so you know, it was one of those close things. I think that the committee decided that, that Douglas solved a harder version of the Radeau problem. I'm oh, sorry, of the plateau problem than Radeau did. Wow. And all four has got the other fields metal mm -hmm. at the same time. Hmm. Okay, so we just talked about that. All right, so now the next thing that uh, I found to be an amazing puzzle, and Tom was sort of in my office when I was fiddling around with this for the first time that I looked at it, uh, the complex exponential. It's, it's a very important map, and it's important to understand its properties, its geometric properties. Um, and, and people often look at the image of the complex exponential map on vertical lines and horizontal lines and rays through the origin. But how many times have you ever seen the image of a circle centered at the origin by the complex exponential map? I'll bet never. I looked in lots of books to see if I could see what, what people had to say about it. And it's quite an interesting thing. So the first thing is, if you look at the complex exponential, it doesn't have any zeros. So that's one of the simple properties. All right, so now what that means is that if you take, um, so this is a theorem. This is um, called the argument principle. If you, if you take a simple closed curve and you map it by the complex exponential map, well, the complex exponential map doesn't have any zeros. And uh, it's also a conformal map, by the way. Its derivative is never zero because it's the complex exponential map again. It, it might map this to a simple closed curve. It might not. Let's pretend that it doesn't. So it might map to something that's not a simple closed curve. But in any case, um, you, can, you can say what you mean by the winding number of this curve around a point. So it's obvious that the winding number should be zero around such a point. It doesn't wind around that point, whatever winding number means. Um, you probably think it ought to be one around such a point and, and maybe two around a point like that. Okay, um, so, but if that happened, here's, so let's, let's suppose um, 
All right, so, so there's a way to make sense out of what you mean by the winding number. And if I, there's, there's a way to write down a formula that will compute it. It's quite neat. I mean, you can actually compute this um, numerically. So if I have a function f, that's a complex analytic function, and I have a curve gamma here, then it maps it to another curve, f of gamma. So let's, let's write it like it's a simple closed curve. It doesn't have to be. So I have f of gamma here. Um, let me look at the um, integral of f prime divided by f around this curve gamma over here. Let me divide it by 1 over 2 pi i and integrate with respect to z. It turns out that's always an integer. And it will count for me the number of zeros and poles of f inside this curve. But it's also got an interpretation as the winding number of the image curve around zero. So it's got two interpretations. One is it's going to count the number of zeros, assuming this is an analytic function. So this is, this is going to count the number of zeros of f inside gamma. And, but it's also got another interpretation. It's the num so now let's, let's take the origin over here. It's equal to the, the number of times the image curve, so that's this curve over here, f of gamma, winds around zero. So you can, you can use either one of these things as an interpretation of this interval over here. But in the case of the exponential function, it has no zeros. So whatever curve I start with, if it's a simple closed curve, the image curve cannot wind around the origin because it doesn't have any zeros. So that means that if I look at, at this circle right here, which does wind around the origin, so take a circle centered at the origin and map it by the exponential, it can't wind around the origin because there's no zeros of the exponential inside this curve. Right? Tom? Okay, so um, that means, now the image is going to be a not necessarily simple closed curve. I'll show you some images in a moment. But certainly, um, if, if this, uh, for instance, if I take a circle of radius 1, it's not too difficult to see that the image is actually a simple closed curve, that it doesn't have any points of self-intersection. And let me draw you a few pictures, or show you a few pictures of these images. Um, okay, so first thing what I did was I showed a picture of the, the blue curves are the logarithmic spirals, which are the images of rays through the origin. The black curves, you can't see them too well, they're images of small circles around the origin. And those, those curves, intersected already orthogonally. So if I look at rays from the origin, that intersects circles centered at the origin orthogonally. Conformal maps preserve angles, so the images have to intersect orthogonally. So the blue curves and the black curves, all of them intersect each other, every place they intersect orthogonally. Um, but to get a better picture of what the images of the um, circles look like, That's little. By the way, hmm? why is this showing up so well? On my so I had a little question here. On my machine, the to, intervals don't show up very well. The to tops install, are cut off. If you install the JS Math fonts, it will look much prettier. You mean I have to install them on my computer? That's what's yeah. going wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's okay. There's the. <coughs> that's the answer to one. So I put some questions in here for you to give okay. me answers to. So that's what I should have done here, okay? Because yeah. because I had, I guess it, did it print off okay? I think it did. Uh -oh. <laughs> no. So it didn't print. See the top yeah, chopped yeah, up. Yeah, I think. Yeah, you want to um, install the JS map. Okay. Yeah. Well, just that some could explain some other things too. Probably. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. So there's a little discussion of winding number that I just gave you. Excellent. 
So here's the images of those curves. Okay, so they're, they're kind of kidney shaped. That's the image, and, and those curves are simple closed curves, and they, they clearly don't uh, go around the origin, as they should not. I mean, there's the origin over there to the left, and, and they're all to the right. So that's a, a few curves of small radius. Uh, but now what happens when you start changing the radius? So they start to bulge around, but they actually cannot surround the origin. That's impossible. What's wow. happening there? OK, so that's now becoming harder to figure out what's going on. You have to put the microscope in there to see what's happening. Um, well, OK, it doesn't surround the origin, right? Wow. OK, but now, now come to something interesting. So these are a little bit bigger circles. Okay. Now something looks like it's really complicated going on in there. <coughs> okay, so here's what happens. And here's where I wish I had had animation also. So I'm going to exaggerate the pictures. By the way, they wind so tightly around the origin, it makes it really difficult to see what's going on. I mean, the, the scale gets modified. It's changed enormously because of there's a factor of, of E to the whatever. And they, so they don't working. wind so quickly around the origin. Well, they wind. Yeah. They wind very tightly. They actually don't surround the origin. Okay, but here's here's a rare animation would have been a great thing to have, especially on some of the later curves that I want to show you. So here's the way I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to draw things to scale because it's really hard to see them to scale. So so we have this region right here that's the image of a circle. And now we start increasing the radius of the circle. And the next thing that happens is that this goes on. Here's the origin in here. That curve doesn't surround the origin. It, but this portion is pinched so tightly, it becomes very difficult to see that. In fact, eventually it's going to look like what I'm saying is wrong. This, these two lobes are going to come back around again and again and again and again. And it's almost impossible to recognize that what's happening is that's what's going on. And it, they're not really surrounding the origin. But if you take a big radius and you look at a sequence of these curves, and every time you look at them on a smaller scale, it still looks like they surround the origin. And what's hard to keep track of is where we are. So if I could have a little bug running around like this, it would be really clear that it bug. doesn't surround. Yeah. So what I'd like to have, like so that's okay. that's what I'm going to ask for. Oh, you're gonna, you want to introduce a bug? I want to introduce a bug that crawls <laughs> along the curve. Is there a way to do that? Like an arrow or something. I want, I want something. Along the curve. So I'm, I'm going to show you some other. Sorry, it would be really. So I, when you even <coughs> look at this picture, it's kind of hard to see how did we get in here. So. Um, I mean, there's certainly one way that you could imagine that I was surrounding the origin when I came in there. But in fact, so you want to see a parametric at a point? You can do it already. Just at a point, you can do the same thing you did. But I want the point to be clearly distinguished from the rest of the, so I can see the point moving along the curve. Yeah, you could do that with the animate. Just have the location of the point be yeah, along the, right the curve. What, what could you do? Now? So you use the. I mean, you use the you interact. Curve. Interact. And you just plot a point. And, and then you move the parameter. Yeah. yeah. And it just. And, well, and what will it? So. I, how big will it make? I mean, will you the point be really visible on the curve? Yeah, you can set yeah, that by size. default. I think it's like five pixels wide or something, so easily visible against the curve. Okay, so I could have done that. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so well, that would have. I don't know if the the scales would work together. I don't know how it would Well, what you do is just always keep exactly this HZZ graphic, and then just do HZZ plus. Yeah, and we'll put that the change the yeah. zoom at all. Uh, you could set, he fixed the zoom by putting explicit yeah. x and the x and x. Even in this picture, and you could make the mistake of thinking that the yellow curve, oops, uh, or better, the, the blue curve, you might think that it, because it's so tight in here, that when it comes in here, it goes around. But in fact, it doesn't. It comes in, it goes up, and oh, yeah. back out like that. Can you, can you and, and you can't see that very well in that picture. Can you change the scale? So Well, I have, so yeah. So. Um, the top and bottom of the same curve, right? The same picture, just By the way, so uh, here's here's a little. Uh, you can, do you know about one the, of them. So so it's a little bit easier to see with a single. Do you curve. know about the fix size command? Hmm? Do you know about the fix size command? Can I show you something? So this is kind of a handy trick. Uh, I don't know if it'll work. Too. We have to define everything. Then. Yeah, I'm sorry. 
Right, it's a start here. Um, I'm not sure we don't need to. Uh, you're, you need to go up. Okay, cool. So look, if you do, um, if you do fig size equals, you can give it a value like 15. And it will draw the same picture but much bigger. And then you can move around and look at it. It's just easier to see. Okay. You see how the entire thing is just huge? Or you can do like fig size equals 25. And That's a multiplication factor, is that what yep. that number and then is? the entire image is huge, and you can kind of scroll around like this. Okay. See, now that's a little too big because you can't see yeah, yeah, what's going to be clear. Okay, but you can play around with it. Like yeah, that. yeah. That's kind of okay. useful for that, is, that is a good idea. Uh, the problem with this curve is that you need to look at it from a, from afar, and you need to look at it up close simultaneously to keep track of where everything is. And you're coming in from far away, and mm -hmm. suddenly when you get in close to the origin, Things go zippity zap, and now you've got to keep track of what side you're on and how you go around and everything. I mean, I know from the simple calculation that the exponential can't wrap around the origin, mm -hmm. but how do you see? I mean, how do you really see that it's not wrapping around the origin? Um, and this, by the way, is of course uh, these curves are still um, pretty small. I mean, in the sense that um, I can make now. Here's. I took the uh, radius to be much larger now for the next set of curves, and I couldn't figure out how to make it plot more points. How do you do that? I, I want, so this is too jagged. How can I increase the number of plot points? There's a um, cryptically called command, uh, or option called plot points that affects the number of points. How so, do you call it? Can uh, so how so can I call it right here? In your parameters, you plot, do common plot points. Do so see there your parametric plot. Yeah. So right before the last parenthesis. Right before the last parenthesis. So you have RGB color and then yeah. uh -huh. okay. give it another option called plot points. Plot points? So comma, comma. Oh, sorry. Okay. Did I erase too much? I think you erased erase one per I erased the parenthesis too much. Uh, comma. Plot points. Yeah. Is, is there an underscore? No. Oh, I thought there was. I, I guess there isn't. No, there isn't. There isn't. Cool. Where you want it. Well, it'll it'll right. And that equals, equals however many points you want to plot. Yeah, like 200. I see, I don't even know how many points there are the default. That was the first thing. What's the default number of plot points? I want to increase them. You have to look at the help, and it's probably 100. Give it 1,000. So, I mean, just you know, try, try 100 and see, and then you can try right. 200. Try 500. Okay. I mean, this is going to take a little while to do, because, all right, so let's try 200. You think that's going to double the number of plot points? Probably. Too bad there isn't a fast float or fast complex. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's slow for a reason, but that reason you have to do shift enter. Nope. Can you just get the real map? Yeah, you can. Okay. Didn't like it. It's pl it looks like it's probably plot Whoa. underscore points. Yeah, that's what it was for me. What is it? Okay, plot underscore, underscore points. Underscore, yeah. plot it's plot it doesn't say, does it? Yeah, it doesn't. That's so you think it should be an underscore right yeah. there? Yep. It's like that? I'll check it. Is that what you think? Yes. Shift enter. It's not dying. So it's probably going to give it time. <laughs> All right, that didn't work. Just it, put more it, points. It did work. Well, it's a little better. It's a little better. So 500 will be even better. Yeah. Well, I want to smooth it out. It's because right. it's doing it, they're linearly spaced along the input. That's yeah, the problem. Yeah, most of them are concentrated yeah. down by the. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they're, they're going to be linearly and spaced along the domain, and so that's going to, yeah. I mean, I need a lot of points. And you can see the smaller ones are doing fine. But not yeah, we need like a plot points funny yeah, option. Yeah. I, don't know. I need it to be adaptively decided. Yeah. I can like adapt that. Mm. I mean, it should, should no, know that it should sample frequently when it's changing. I don't think it does. That's pretty good. Okay, yeah, great. Like We've answered right there. Yeah, that's not good. Very good. Okay. Now, now, if you look at this curve, you're going to think that this is looking wrong. It looks like it surrounds the origin, doesn't it? But it doesn't. Because if you look in close to the origin, you'll see that wow. very complicated things are going on. It actually does not surround it. I mean, this is the first thing you might look at. Oh, there's a mistake. It's surrounding the origin. But uh, do I have, I think I have it blown up so you can see. There it is. Now it still looks like it's surrounding the origin, doesn't it? But it can't be. Um, well, so I guess I didn't do any more. But, but in any case, um, you just have to keep 
blowing up what goes on in here to see what really occurred. <coughs> but it sure looks like that it comes around the origin and goes back out. But it doesn't. So, that's, um, so, so let me. Now this is another example where I, it's a similar curve. It's a slightly a single curve, a slightly bigger radius. And I and I took the to, to declutter it. I just blew up and blew up and blew up the center. So now it still looks bad, but that's much more complicated than you actually think it is. So so this is actually you should read these in reverse order. This just looks like it goes in and it comes back out, but it doesn't. So you should reverse the way things look. And this is still pretty complicated. In there. This doesn't go through the origin. And here's a case, so th this is a curvy racing. So, so this was a case where I really did want to have the bug oops, like that. So I really wanted to have the bug go around this and then have it blow up as it comes in here and so on. And what you're saying is that I should interact, use interact together with the parameter. And mm -hmm. then what is it that you do to make it put the point on there? I think it's just point. Like you, you, can add, you can add images, so you do plus, there's a point command, so you just do plus point of whatever its coordinates are. Yeah. You do what? Plus, it. Just like, like you add. Oh, so then an additional. <coughs> you, like to the plot, you can say that kk equals that, just like you would add plus point of the coordinate to the point. And that'll add a point onto the plot. Okay, and how do you make it visible? To show, just like what you have. No, no, I mean, how do you make it big enough so that Oh, there's a size parameter. Point Wait, of a pair of shape. An example. Well, you can do it on this one. Yeah. So there's a parametric plot. So now if I go kk plus point at 1, 1, and I want it to be purple, I want it point size to be 10. Okay, so, so it's a point size. There. Or if you do point size 15. Yeah, okay, so that's just a point floating out. It yeah, you can stick little, wherever you want. But, but what I would do in there is put the parameter, uh -huh. parameterization. So K of T, so let me just put K of T here. And, uh, what, what are the, the range of zero to five? It's from zero to five. That's the full range. So all the way around. So. And you, you need to make the point. You need to take your own matching points here. I might actually just do the automatically. I don't know. I think it might be too boring. Oh, really? Hey, yes, you're doing that. Sorry. Don't you take, have to take real and imaginary part? part? Right. So you have to take real and imaginary part of kill. Let me sneak around that. Right, right, right. 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 You're going to have to do it. And you don't want the T, is there? I just want K. K doesn't want the T. Because then you just say where it is. But there's your controllable bug. Okay. So you moving pretty quickly. It's going to move really quickly outside of it. Yeah, see, that it does move uniformly when you've moved uniformly in the parameter. But that's still great. So you can move it. Mm -hmm. oh, there it is. Yeah, and now it's going to while. Yeah, yeah, for a while. Nice. And you can also make the, uh, the, the plot region a function so of t as well. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, just big enough well, to contain no. the point in the origin. So yeah. Yeah. You can make the, the, the plot, the x min and x max functions of t and g, oh. and make it zoom in and out of those two. Uh, let's see, so you said I have x min and x max, so x min. Oh, so you want blob. Uh, it's really tiny. <laughs> so maybe you tap it the plate and then make your x min and x max a point plus or minus somewhere. Like this, and then the Is that the machine epsilon? Is that what no, you're trying to I don't know what epsilon is. I'll make it up in a second. But does that mean machine epsilon by default? No, no, it's not defined. I'm going to make it 0 0.1 or 0 0.01. So I'm zoomed in really close to wherever the. Yeah, see, so you didn't get enough of a curve being viewed to see what's happening. <laughs> that will come up. Well, there you're up. You're up so now you're there. there. <laughs> now, now suddenly you've got to blow it up a whole lot more in order to see what goes on. So there, now you're stuck. Okay. It should be proportional, like. Two times x. Okay. Well, two times absolute value.
see, look, see how suddenly it got even more. See, look at that. <laughs> that's oh, pretty wow. good. That's pretty good. That was pretty good. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's impressive. Well, that's good. I don't know. Yeah. You yeah. think it went outside the distance. distance. Out of range. Does that just mean it got so it, small it couldn't distinguish the points? <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Jim. Thanks, you might. Yeah, maybe with the X min and X max, or they're too small to have the wrong side or something. No, I think it's like a rounding error. Yeah, it was. It was a problem in the text. That's really neat. Yeah, look, you see, see like that. Wow. Look at that. Okay, good. You finally sweet. You've gotten it. In. Okay. Wow, they just keep coming. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. We finally got it, I believe. <laughs> wow. That's really scary. Yeah. So it, so now, you're, now you're going out with him. No, I'm low. It's still going in. No, you're going out. Uh, you're going, going out. out. You're going out. Oh, right. right. You're, you're going out. out. I mean, it's hard to see it from the forest from the trees. It's like a little movie. You were deep inside and suddenly you were going out. Wow, that's cool. Uh, that was fun. That's good. All right, well, put that on my, my uh, cool. <laughs> the flash drive. Because you've answered a whole bunch of my questions. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, it's amazing how uh, good of an idea Interact is. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's Game Mathematica. <laughs> who, would, who would have ever thought that complex exponential had this yeah. crazy, funny behavior? I've Literally, I've never seen anybody say anything about this anymore. Wow, that is so weird. Isn't it? It's is there some easy. measure of it? Even though it's not the winding number, but there's some measure. Oh, uh, how, it's how complicated around. it is? Like how it's winding around. Uh, well, like certainly it does wind around. around some points. It yeah. doesn't wind around the origin. That's but maybe on the function which attaches to each point in the plane, the winding number. Maybe that's an interesting function. Well, I'm sure it is. The, you should plot that function. Yeah, right. And it'll be a, a continuous integer valued functions on an open set in the plane. Uh -huh. But it will have discontinuities when you cross the curve and right. jump. Uh -huh. Just like in this picture yeah. over here. Okay, that makes so, sense. So the winding so number is winding 0, 1, 2. Mm -hmm. uh, this open set is 2, and this open set is 1, and this open set is 0. It's continuous, and then suddenly it changes. So it's going to look really cool when you zoom in more and more and more. Yeah, yeah. actually that might be a good thing to do is to put a label inside each one of those With regions to say what the winding number of a point in such a region is, because that's a number. <coughs> it's a fixed integer. And cool. it jumps as you move in. Cool. That would also help students understand the argument principle, because that's mm -hmm. what this illustrates, mm -hmm. how many times something winds around. So, Thank you for helping me out. Excellent. And thanks for inviting me. All right. Okay, so put that back on the <laughs> flash drive. <laughs> you, you stored answers to a lot of my questions here. Cool. Um, I'm glad that I brought the flash drive in instead of. Yeah.